Welcome to another episode of Salvation Solutions. I'm Avian. I am Aramis. And I'm Pastor D. So today we're actually going to do part two of Kingdom Expanders because last week we were kind of rushing through at the end. So we want to make sure that we just expound a little bit on what we were speaking of. So Papa D, we're going to start at Matthew 16, 16 to 19. So why don't you go through and then we'll just jump into it. Yeah, uh, we want to kind of um, dive back into this thought because, you know, we didn't do it justice. I guess I didn't rush through it and, you know, that it kind of thing. Fun. Yeah, yeah, I take responsibility. <laughs> But um, I just want to recap real quick uh, this particular scripture because I want to comment on um, verse 19 more than anything. But Jesus was speaking to his disciples at this time. He was talking to them about, you know, wanting them to know who he was and trying to identify himself to them so they would really understand where he was coming from. And he asked them the question, who do men say that I am? And they said, you know, what the men said, everything from John the Baptist to Elisha. And, and he said, well, who do you say that I am? And, you know, I'm sure they all kind of went through their questions in their mind. And then out of kind of out of nowhere, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, you know, Jesus said, you know, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. Well, what's unique about that and what I want to talk about is that word Christ there actually speaks to um, the one who God has anointed as king. And this was very important in the in the psyche of the nation of Israel because there was a promise that there would be a deliverer, a Messiah, who would come and deliver them from the oppression at this particular time of the Roman Empire. And that was the mindset of the nation of Israel at that particular time. Now, I'm a big movie buff of movies like Game of Thrones, uh, The Last Kingdom, uh, and other movies <laughs> in that vein. And what I love about those movies, it really helps give me a, a comprehensive insight on how kingdoms operate and how a king thinks and how kingdoms function. And everybody in those type movies, they want to follow the king who is the anointed king or the one who God is anointed to be king because with that comes favor, comes blessing, comes winning wars, comes um, conquering territories and things of that nature. And so when the um, this title or this name, because Christ isn't Jesus, it wasn't Jesus' last name. Mm -hmm. It was actually a title given to him as being the one who came through the line of David as the anointed king. As we know, David was the, was the king of war. He was the warring king that helped Israel overcome all of their enemies and allowed Solomon to establish the kingdom of Israel and establish his kingdom in a place of peace and prosperity. And that speaks to actually, it actually speaks to the, um, the, the process of salvation. Jesus was a warring king. And because of him winning the war uh, over sin, over um, poverty, we now can build our life in peace. That's the idea behind David, him coming in the, in the, um, in the, in the, under the lineage of David. But the anointed king is what Christ represents, one who God has anointed to be king. Now, the only difference is Jesus didn't come to, to create or to cause a ruckus or to create a coup, a coup or, or try to overthrow Caesar's government. He actually came as the word of God says, without observation, without the idea of causing and creating a war and threatening Caesar's kingdom, he actually, he actually endorsed Caesar's kingdom. He said, man, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to me what belongs to me. I'm not coming here to be unruly or, 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 or be anti-government. I'm actually coming at this time to show you about my kingdom. Remember when the Bible talks about Jesus came in the fullness of time. That fullness of time was a reference to the time in which Jesus came to where there was a, a governmental order that, that was the closest um, uh, thing or resembled more than any other government of order at that time to the kingdom. And God came, and Jesus came at the time to where he could speak kingdom language and people would understand it. That's why the centurion servant understood exactly what Jesus was talking about when talking about the kingdom of God. That's why he's man. I ain't found more, no faith greater than this. This man get it. But he was, he was, he was entrenched in the kingdom government. He was a centurion servant. He was, he was a man of authority, but yet under authority. And so all these things matter when it came to why Jesus came and who Jesus revealed himself to be. And it was important for um, the disciples to understand this, that I come to establish a government, not with observation, not with threat of war, not with trying to, you know, um, threaten uh, the other man's government. But we come in a very, in a very um, stealthy way. We come in a way that will, that will slowly impact you, like leaven, which works its way through the entire lump, like yeast, which, which eventually works its way through the, through the entire lump of dough, right? That's how he comes. He comes in a manner that you, you, you look up and you don't even recognize him. You don't even realize it's happening, but, but then all of a sudden it done, it done consumed you, it done took over. So Jesus revealed himself as the Christ, 
the son of the living God. The idea of sonship is equality with God. That's the idea of sonship. Most people glaze over that, that last part, but sonship means equal in function, equal in power, equal in capacity, equal in the way I do things. Like, thou art the anointed king who can do the things that God does, or who can function as a God. And that's, that's who the Christ was. And so once Jesus revealed that, then he talked about how he would then use this revelation of him being the anointed king and one who's equal with God. He was going to build his church off that revelation. And once the church was, was established in that revelation, now I'm going to give you keys. And these keys is how we're supposed to go forth and advance the kingdom. These keys is how we go forth and declare what things should be. Because a true, true government, and, and what we didn't mention was <clears throat> prior to the Roman Empire, the way kings built their kingdoms was they would go to a, a, a foreign territory and they would capture that territory. They'd kill as many people as they needed to kill. And then they would burn the cities. And then they would bring the slave, the people back to their country and make them slaves. Well, Rome didn't operate like that. What Rome would do is they would go and they would conquer territory but then they would try to preserve as much of the land as they could and preserve as many of the people as they could. But then they would want to colonize that particular territory. And what Caesar would do is he would create a ecclesia. Ecclesia is not a religious term, but it's a term that speaks to a, a, a king's cabinet or a king's court officials. Those who he would sit around and pour his vision into and pour his heart into and share with them how he wanted to see a thing, see, see this particular territory colonized and established as its empire, a part of its empire. And he would create a governor and he would send that governor to that territory. And he would send this governor with all the force and all the might and all the power of his kingdom. And that governor then was responsible for turning that territory into a mini Rome or a mini wherever they were from. And they were responsible for establishing a whole new culture. And with that authority, with that power, came the power to bind and loose. That's a governmental activity. That's a kingly activity that would take place within the colonization or the process of colonizing a particular territory. Uh, we, go to, we go to Airman's house. I go to, I'm, I'm taking over Airman's house, right? I decided to go to Airman's house and I say, you know what? I'm going to colonize Airman's home. I'm going to make it look like my house. I go to, I, I play, I play, you know, hip hop at my house. I get to Airman's house. He play, you know, he play rock. Well, guess what? I'm binding that. Man, we ain't listening to no more rock. Only hip hop. Mm. I bind that rock music and I, and I loose hip hop in the Airman's home. That's the process of me beginning to colonize, colonize his house. That's the same thing they would do. They would bind things that didn't represent the, the Roman Empire and they would loose things into that territory that would represent it. Socially, economically, governmentally. You know, um, within the arts and the sports, all of that stuff would eventually be colonized and changed. And so this is the picture that Jesus was giving um, the disciples when he was talking about he was the Christ. Okay, so I have a lot of questions going on in my mind with all of that information. Do you have anything? <laughs> not yet. Okay, not yet. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to point something out. I love the way that you say that Jesus didn't come to cause a, a ruckus. He kind of mm -hmm. came in slow, and then all of a sudden you saw that he was basically behind you. Mm -hmm. And I feel that as entrepreneurs, I like when people say that we should move in silence until, mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. we are doing what we are doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel that sometimes when we're working under kingdom, we look at society and say, oh, I actually need to make some noise. I need right. to make a ruckus to let people know I'm here. Right. But you saying that just kind of speaks to me like, no, actually, we should be coming in slow and steady mm -hmm. and just you know, as you say, colonizing little mm -hmm. by little. Mm -hmm. So I actually like that because that's a different approach to entrepreneurship. Well, it's, it's the kingly approach. Mm -hmm. And most folks don't operate their business from a kingly perspective. Yeah. You know, there's, there's the degree of marketing and making yourself known and letting people know the value that you can add to their life. But it's different than what most people, you know, try to market when it's more about being loud, being vocal. The loudest in the room is one who get all the attention. Mm -hmm. They say stuff like, what is it said, the, 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 the squeaky wheel gets the attention. Right. Well, no, 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 not necessarily. Like, like there's a way that we can, we can in a very uh, strategic way. So, so to be stealthy speaks to being strategic. It's being, it's being wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. It's, it's, being, it's being timely. You know, it's being accurate. You know, it's, it's appealing to the thing that I know that you can't resist. It's, it's, it's a way of, 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 of uh, relating to people. 
like the woman, like the woman um, uh, at the well. Like, like what I tell people all the time, Jesus, Jesus was a master marketer. He was an outstanding offerer. I mean, he had offer skills that was that was out of this world, and he was and he was a sensational salesman. Like he was the ultimate entrepreneur. Like the first thing God showed us about Himself was His entrepreneurial capability in creation. And then he taught man. Then he told man, he said, the same way you just watch me create and put systems in place that's going to enable me to rest, I want you to do the same thing. He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue. All of those are entrepreneurship activities. Life is one big entrepreneurial endeavor. So, so Jesus demonstrated that, especially with the woman at the world. He related to her in such a way that not only did she repent, she went and started telling everybody. She began to lead the whole town to Jesus, right? Because he dealt, he, he, he related to her in such a way that she couldn't resist what he had to offer her. He eventually said, listen, I got some water that you want. You don't have to come back to this well. He said, Mike, she said, give me that water. I want it. <laughs> give it to me. So, you know, Jesus was that, and he, was, he did it in a very stealthy way. You know, you saying that, though, I feel like people don't like to actually bring Jesus or God down as, as human. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they really like to keep the idea of God and Jesus on a whole other separate spectrum that we're not supposed to touch. Because they like superheroes. That's a great point. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. They like superheroes. They, well, they, they, they want to be saved. They want to be rescued. That's true. So, but my, my thought with that is that will people actually receive this because it makes it makes Jesus sound too human. It, it makes what he does sound too attainable. And, and, that's, and that's one of the biggest mistakes the organization of the church has made. And I say that very carefully. Remember, there's two sides. There's the organism, mm -hmm. and there's the, then there's the organization. The, organiz the organism has dwarfed the organization, right? It's the, the, I'm sorry. The organization has dwarfed the organism. The organism has to come to the forefront with this gospel of the kingdom of God. The organization is propagating a religious gospel called Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. The organism is the one with the revelation of the kingdom of God, the gospel that Jesus preached. And then, then we can reveal Jesus, not only as the God man or the, or the, or the anointed king, but also as the man, the human man that he was, mm -hmm. that, that needed something to eat, that got tired and went to sleep, that, had, that, that worked and submitted to his family, to his mother and his father. Like he was all human and he was all God. Just like we're all humanity, but we're all God. And our spirit man is all God. And our, body, and our soul is man, and our physical man is all humanity. Yeah, I know they don't like yeah, it, but that's what it right is. There. But that's what it is. And we have to get out of this religious mindset that, that you, know, um, you know, Christianity puts us in and see it from the standpoint of what it really is. That God, Jesus came to make king. He's a kingmaker, right? He's an entrepreneur. He came to help us overcome the ultimate enemy of poverty through entrepreneurial endeavor. And that's what's important for us to see, that he gave us the ability to bind and loose. But if I don't see that from a kingdom perspective, I'm going to take that out of the context. And I'm not walking in kingdom revelation. I'm not functioning as a king, but I'm going to try to say I bind that in Jesus' name. No, it don't quite work like that. You can try to bind it all you want. Well, while we're on that, um, I, I saw I saw a post on Facebook um, and it dealt with it dealt with entrepreneurs being called out for for lack of a better term entrepreneurs bagging on on people who work a nine to five uh saying that you know it, it's a poor life choice and you know it, it, they should be entrepreneurial and, and you know just in, in any way shape or form that a, a person who works nine to five can be shamed right um the pushback though was that uh, you know, entrepreneurs are, you know, shaming nine to fivers all the while working themselves up to a point where they need their own individual workforce yeah. for, for their companies that they've right. developed. So they're kind of, in essence, digging themselves into a hole by bashing the nine to fivers because eventually after a while you're going to need us. Right. Right. So what's, what's the kingdom perspective on that? Because yeah. somebody's got to be right. Well, right. So, so right. No, right. No, and, and people don't have a kingdom perspective. And let me say this, that it's important to know that everybody has to start somewhere. So yeah. ha having a nine to five is not something that's bad or right. should be frowned upon, but you got to start somewhere. Their mindset is 
is keeping, or the idea is not keeping the mindset to have a nine to five. Right. right. God never intended for us to exchange our time for money. Right. He never intended for us to exchange our time for money. He intended for you to exchange your talent for money, your gifting for money, right. and, and, and have nothing, have it not, have your time not trapped by in a, having a job, so to speak. The Bible says redeem the time. There's only one way to redeem the time, right? I buy my time back. When I, when I get to the place where I'm not exchanging my time for money, but I'm exchanging my talent for money, mm -hmm. right? That's what God, and that's entrepreneurial activity. Right. So you may start off on a job, and that's fine. The kingdom perspective of that is entrepreneurialism should be looked at as the mechanism of me being a blessing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have a perversion of entrepreneurialism. We have a perversion of capitalism. Mm -hmm. we, talk, we talked earlier about the pervert. Jesus dealt with the perversion of capitalism when he went into the temple and started turning over the money table. Right. That was his way of dealing with that perversion. People, the money changers and the people who sold those were 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 perverting, uh, taking advantage of those who had to come long a long way or those who were poor and they needed to offer something. They would they would jack the prices up on them. You know, they would they would exchange or make make the money change exchange, you know, yeah. astronomically, you know, disproportionate to what it was really about mm -hmm. the value of it. And so Jesus came and flipped all that stuff over. That was Jesus declaration against the perversion of capitalism that we have today. Mm -hmm. But true entrepreneurialism is about me being a blessing to you. It's about me putting you in a position where you overcome poverty. In the kingdom, it's about deployment. In the world, it's about employment. Mm -hmm. And the difference in that is me employing you. I employ you, Aviance, and I, I want to employ you as, you know, um, my, my, you know, you, my, you, my, my seat, what it would be, you'd be my CFO, my chief financial officer, right? And I'm going to pay you to do this job. Now, I set a certain amount to pay you, you know, $40 an hour, right? And I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much work you do. I don't care how, how, how long, how much energy and effort and how much time you dedicate to me. I'm only paying you $40 an hour. That's it. Well, that's not the way of the kingdom, right? True deployment in the kingdom is this. I offer you an opportunity to fulfill a particular assignment for me. Me as the king who owns everything, mm -hmm. I say, listen, what is your needs at home, in life, so that I can take care of them? Because all I want you to do is focus on your assignment. The king now takes full responsibility of your personal belongings, your well-being. That's why the God says this. He said, listen, don't worry about what you're going to eat, mm -hmm. what you're going to drink, where you're going to live. He says, seek first the kingdom. In other words, the word seek means to ascertain my mind. Find out what it is that I think about you. Find out what it is that I have for you to do in my kingdom. Mm -hmm. And my righteousness, which means the righteousness speaks to what I've assigned for you to do. And all these things will be added unto you. In other words, the king's mind is to care for you and all your personal needs as long as you focus on fulfilling your assignment. And all you got to do is focus on fulfilling your assignment. Don't worry about those things. Poor folk worry about those things anyway. Think about it. Rich folk don't worry about where they're going to sleep, what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat. They don't worry about that stuff. Right. right? So the idea behind John Matthew 6, 33 is that seeking the kingdom and his righteousness is the key to overcoming poverty. So the kingdom perspective on entrepreneurialism and employment and deployment are totally different and so we we got to understand that before we even begin to talk about anything else so is it is it more is is the model shark tank or is it more extensive than that mm -hmm. you, you ever seen shark tank yeah yeah, yeah. yeah shark people tank. come on they present yeah. their business and right. it is it is is the idea to be the person on the panel you know watching these proposals and, Listen, and, and ultimately giving, ultimately we, we we talked earlier like 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 the richest men in the world you know people like jeff bezos and uh mark, mark, mark zimmerman the boy out of the boy out of the microsoft guy um, oh, bill, gates. bill gates all of it listen the bible says like this powerful versus script this is let, let let every man look not unto his own but another man's wealth mm -hmm. their focus should not be their wealth at all it's probably not but they should they should be they should be using their resources and using their money money to go into the to the poorest areas of America and of the world and say, how can we help you overcome poverty? Right. Shark Tank is a great expression of being a blessing to people. Mm -hmm. 
right? Most folks consider being a blessing, you know, taking fifty thousand dollars and building a community center in the middle of the, in the middle of the ghetto. No, no, no. Listen, you ain't serious about helping me until you systemically come up with a plan to systemically bring me out of poverty. Shark Tank, help me develop the gifting that I have. Help me develop the entrepreneurial skill necessary. Help me to develop and come up with a business plan that I can make this business that's inside of me come alive. Remember, right. the kingdom of heaven is within us. Remember, Jesus says it comes, it, comes, it comes not by observation, but it's within us. Now, what I have to learn how to do is tap into everything that the kingdom embodies. Entrepreneurialism, creativity, production, love, faith, grace, mercy. Uh, uh, um, um, all the giftings that come that come with that, you know, all of the everything that the kingdom embodies, I got to tap into those things, and I got to let those allow those things to be released out of me. That's what I need. I need to get to a place where, listen, I'm gonna help you to bring bring that kingdom business up out of you, the king and the queen that's inside. I'm gonna bring it out of you, and so that's that's what true entrepreneuring entrepreneurship is all about. That's what it, when the Bible says this to Abraham, he said, listen, he said, he said. Thou shalt be a blessing. The blessing we find out from Proverbs is designed to make one rich. It, the blessing is designed strictly to affect the economics of your life. If I'm going to truly be a blessing to you, some way, some form, some fashion, I got to do something that's going to empower you to build your econo economy and help you to overcome poverty. And so that's what it means when we talk about, you know, um, the kingdom perspective of, of wealth creation and the kingdom perspective of wealth building, and truly being a blessing and functioning as an entrepreneur. I go into business. True entrepreneurship is based on love. It's based on love. It's based on me wanting to help you become what God wants you to become. It's like you being your A-King solution. You, you, you hate to see people <laughs> unorganized. <laughs> I was going to say be disorganized. You hate, you hate to see it, right? And it's, and it's your love for people to bring order to their life. That's, that's, as, that's as great of expression of kingdom as you can possibly find. It's two words that disrupt the kingdom of God is power and order. It's the power to establish order, right? And to deal with chaos and confusion. So like that, that, that's birthed by love. Love, love, my love for you will produce or activate my creative ability to solve your problems, right? And then now I gotta produce the solution that I create. Now I can serve you, yeah. right? Abundant life is a fourfold word. Love, create, produce, serve. That's what it is. And I'm not talking about serving, you know, I'm talking about serving by selling. I'm talking about selling you my service, okay. mm -hmm. right? I'm not talking about giving away for free. I'm talking about serving by selling. The scripture says it like this. He that withholds the corn, the people will curse him. But that's arrogant though. I mean, if you got the money, you should just give it away. No, no, I get that, but that ain't how it works. And it depends depend on the situation too. Now, also it depends on the situation. Now, you, you you might have a point. I know you're being facetious, but you might have a point <laughs> that, that if I'm in a position, in, in some cases, I may be in a position to where I know Johnny down there, you know, oh, where yeah, it might yeah, be, yeah, they yeah. can't afford it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm not going. I may have to. I'm at to sow that into their life. Right. Right. But in most cases, when we're talking about from a business perspective, we're not talking about a philanthropic perspective. Right. 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 Like I'm talking about from a business perspective, right. I'm going to sell you my product. Yeah. Right. And there's something about that exchange of in selling that 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 strengthens our connection. There's a scripture that came that I was meditating on the other day that brought that that thought to me that. Um, no, you brought it up in, our, in, in last week's podcast. You said you said uh, I was talking about the exchange and you was like and you brought up the idea of paying for something. And I said, she's right on with that. I wanted to follow that thought up. But. The idea when, when we make that exchange, well, I was talking about the exchange we made with uh, that God made with us with Jesus. I think that's what it was. And you brought the idea up of inserting that into a in, from a business perspective, but that that's what it's about. It's those four things, and, and it's about being creative, and it's about being entrepreneurial. And we got we got we got to embrace that because that's what the kingdom of God is about. So, what if I am an entrepreneur, but I don't have the means right now to deploy? I actually need to have a workforce. Yeah. So I know that you actually call it team team members. So yeah. is that is is that still of a of an entrepreneur mindset? Is that I can't really deploy you. Right. I kind of need you to right. Quit. No, well, and that's why right. No, and that's why. So we talked about uh, the kingdom being built on a commonwealth structure. 
Mm -hmm. the, the economic structure in the kingdom is, is, is based on the commonwealth. The commonwealth, the idea of commonwealth starts with the king owning everything. But a king also, a true king has a desire to give the citizens and those who are part of his team access to all of his wealth, right? But it's access based on, based on covenant, right? It's based on, you know, relationship. It's based on, you know, an exchange, right? So a true king always has a, has a vision for his kingdom. And, you know, wherever you, wherever you, you know, can, can advance and help that vision to be, be manifested is where you would fit. And you would go to the king and, and you would go to the king and says, you know, I'm gifted in this area. I can help advance your kingdom in this area. The king will deploy you in that. And he makes you all your needs to take care of and give you the uh, release to go do that. Well, in the case you just talked about, that's where the kingdom profit sharing concept would come in. That's one of the closest ways we can get to a commonwealth under a structure within a business that there's a need for, you know, us to grow together. So in other words, I, I pay you a certain amount to do a certain job at this particular time because from a business perspective, that's what we can afford. Well, you do that job plus you come up with a more efficient way, a more way where it saves me time, where it saves me money, where it saves us energy. And I now can, from a business perspective, save money by doing that. Well, I don't take that money that I saved and put it in my pocket and forget about you. I should share that profit, that revenue with you, yeah. right? That way we all grow together as, as, as the, as the um, bottom line, as my year in revenue uh, increase, so, so should your salary increase or so, so should your, your reward increase, right? I may not necessarily, you know, uh, increase your rate of pay, but I may give you a bonus, right. right? So there's a lot of ways that we can function entrepreneurially and from a kingdom mindset than the oppressive, mm -hmm. the oppressive manner of employment where people pay, get paid a certain amount and they, 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 they cause the increase or they cause the revenue for the, or the profit for the company to increase by 20%, but I don't give them a raise by 20%. You know, I don't increase them by, you know, cost of living, what well, that might be 2%, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, so functioning as a entrepreneur in the kingdom of God, you know, from a game, kingdom of God perspective, is so much different than, you know, what the world, what the world propagates. So, all right, well then let's, let's, let's talk about the people that we almost never want to be in front of, right? Mm -hmm. Salesperson. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It is is the sales industry as a whole it is is there is there a godly perspective to that because we all look at the sales industry and the salesperson as the snake the swindler you just try you know you selling me snake oil you know i mean it, it is is there for <laughs> you know um it, it is is there is there a kingdom perspective to selling well sales is a godly sales is a godly thing Let's say that first of all. Sales is a biblical concept. It's something that that we do in life. Like like everybody at some point will, is going to have to have the skills to sell, if not themselves. Like a job interview is just it's just you mm -hmm. selling yourself. So we shouldn't have a negative perspective on sales. Sales is something that that we see throughout the scripture all the time, right? When it come when it came to the widow woman when her husband had died, she went to the prophet and she said, "Listen." My, my husband, who used to be your guy, he don't he don't want on, but he left us some debt. And the prophet said, "Man, what you want me to do? Right? Start your own business. Go borrow and then go sell. Pay you off your, your debt house. and live off the rest. Yeah. Right? So selling is, is is God's mechanism for overcoming poverty. So when we're talking about selling, Jesus was a sensational salesman, but his sales tactics wasn't to coerce, wasn't to trick up, wasn't to abuse, wasn't to lie, wasn't to mislead people at all." He just presented you such a such a beautiful offer. You couldn't say no. Mm. You take you take his offer to Peter to come follow me. Well, what did he do that? What did he do to Peter before before he made him that offer? He, he put him in retirement. <laughs> he retired. He said, Peter, listen, man, I don't want you to worry about none of that stuff. He said, listen, forget about them fish. Come on and help find men. You know, I'm gonna make you fish for men. I'm gonna give you dominion over men now, right? So when we talk about Jesus as a salesman, we got to talk about the value that he would present to you before he would make the offer. Right. You couldn't say no. The woman, at the, the woman at the well. Now what people don't tell you about this woman is she, would, she went at the hottest time of the day. Well, why did she do that? 
normally most women want at the cool of the day. To she went at the noon, at the hottest time of the day, to avoid the abuse and the ridicule that she would get for being the woman that she was, having six husbands, right? Mm -hmm. When he offered her water, that she would have to come back to this well during the heat of the day, trying to avoid the abuse, give me that water. I need that water. See, Jesus related, and he related, and he marketed to her need, to the thing that, to the thing that, that she wanted more than anything. So we got to understand these things, and he didn't do it in a way that made her made her feel less than or made him look sleazy. But but he mastered the 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 technique of of um, touching and feeling the needs of her as a woman or Peter as a man. I mean, and that's what it's all about. Sales is not you know something that we need to turn our nose up at. It's actually something we need to perfect because at some point in life. You're going to need the ability to sell. I mean, listen, when, when you're ordering food on the phone from people, you got you to gotta sell them. You got you to gotta put it, you know, talk to them in a way that they're going to do your food right and they're going to play with it. Or to at least make sure that they give you something that they don't even make there. Or if you want to do it like that. Yeah. That's how I like to make yeah. it happen. <laughs> you got to sell them on it. Listen. You got to sell them on that thing. Yo, you, can, you, you can do it. You, you can, can make it. some more money if you just you put this goat cheese right. in this sandwich right. for yeah, me. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> You. That's how it works. You definitely got some keys. That's we need to know. <laughs> no, <laughs> doubt. Ah, yeah, praise God. But no, yeah. it's, that's 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 how you got to do it, son. So sales is something that we need to embrace, um, and not run from. It don't have to be nothing stage. You just got to understand that Jesus was a master marketer, and he had the offer skills like nobody else. But he was also a salesman. He had sensational salesmanship, and it wasn't about coercing you, but it was about leading you into making the right decision for you. Right. That's gonna add the best value to your life, right. and that's how we gotta see sales. Like I gotta, like, like, man, listen. The scripture, and I quoted earlier, "He that withholdeth the corn, the people shall curse him." Right, but he that selleth it, a blessing is upon your head. The people will rejoice. Like, 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 we gotta see it like this. I love you so much. You love Papa D so much that you gonna, you gonna, you gonna do everything in your power to convince Papa D to use your service of administration. To get... To <laughs> well, I think the term is voluntold. Voluntold. I think that you voluntold. No, 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 I'm being serious. No, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. That, but her heart got to be, I got to, what, what, what do I have to do to convince Papa D to, to buy my service? Like, I got to find a way to appeal to him that when he go, because he need my service. Yeah. I can add so much value to his business. I can bring so much order to his business. So much I gotta find a way that he that, to make him to put him in the mindset that he's willing to exchange his money with me, and that's how we have to think. Like that's that's because that's because true entrepreneurship is birthed out of love, hmm. right? And th that's how that that's how that goes. Hmm. We're getting so, deep into something. Baby. Yeah, that's I mean, that <laughs> getting that's deep okay. into something. We can talk more about it afterwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Are there any last thoughts? We're actually gonna do good for you, folks. Are there any last thoughts that we have? Well, um, we I do, I do want to, we do, we're going to have to come back and probably do a third lesson, but I want to be sure that we make sure people understand that. Um, he said, he said, I want to give you the keys of the kingdom and the keys represents knowledge, right? And keys were designed to unlock and to lock. Keys are, un are designed to bind and to loose. And when Jesus was talking about the keys, I'm going to give you the keys. He's talking about, uh, Luke talks about, um, the religious folks, they, sh they, they, they shut they prevent people from having the key of knowledge that will unlock the treasures of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm going to give you keys. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I'm going to give you the ability, the revelation knowledge, to release the treasures of heaven that's inside of you. Not in heaven, but that's already inside of you. Those, the gifting that's inside of you. That anointing that's inside of you. The love that's inside of you. The goodness that's inside of you. The grace that's inside of you. The mercy. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you all those keys. I'm going to unlock all those treasures. And those are the very things that enable you to function in godliness and walk as a God in the earth. I'm going I'm to give you the keys to unlock all those things. And the authority that comes with that revelation will enable you to bind and loose and release the kingdom of God into all the earth. We used an example earlier of Aviance and her um, A King Solution business, how, how she is to, to take over and advance the kingdom of God through her business. Mm -hmm. It's by the more businesses she helped to organize themselves, and to, and to produce wealth is her way of advancing the kingdom because she's using kingdom 
organizational structure and principle to bring order to your business. And all of a sudden, people say, man, where do you get this knowledge from? How do you do this? And she'll say, listen, I got this book, this manual that I read. Mm -hmm. Right? What, what, what manual is that? The Bible. And people, they can't deny it because she's, the results that she's right. produced in the business will want them to continue to do business. That's what the kingdom is talking about, making disciples. You know, you ain't going to do that until you come in there and tell about some, listen, before we talk about business, I got some Bible. I got a Bible. I got some, mm. some scripture I want to quote. Oh, man, get that right. out of here. ain't going to let you right. in the room. Right. Right. I have a right? Bible and a walking manual. Yeah, yeah. Have a name I can call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, but but that's what I want to be sure we understand that 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 binding and loosing because that is how the kingdom is advanced and it comes through us first knowing that that Jesus was the God anointed King that came through the line of David that that brought a kingdom. He brought a kingdom. He brought a kingdom. He didn't bring religion. He didn't bring Christianity. Man didn't lose Christianity. Man didn't lose religion. Man lost power. He lost kingdom. And the and only way that we're going to truly walk in the power and be the church that God has called us to be is if, we're, is if we're walking in the authority of the kingdom of God and expanding the kingdom in a manner that, that establishes the order and brings about the, the glory or the recognition of who God is as a king. And then that's how we're going to really see the, the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our God. I love that. And yeah. I love that you... You make it clear that we didn't lose a religion or anything. We lost power. Yeah, we lost power. That's what That's every, huge. every heart yearns for power. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm done. Okay. So until then, make sure you uh, comment. Make sure you like. Make sure you share. If you have any questions, please let us know. Until then, be blessed and be safe.